I want to share with you today why I'm excited about augmented reality. And that is that I believe that augmented reality has the potential to rescue our relationship with our smartphones. I don't have to tell you that our smartphones play a central role in our lives. Uh, these days, uh, kids get a cell phone at the age of 13 or so, and forever after, they have that cell phone with them day and night, using it hundreds of times a day. And of course, it's wonderful that this device gives us access to the world's knowledge. However, uh, I think increasingly we're realizing that these devices also have a very detrimental effect, um, both on our mental well-being, our physical well-being, as well as our social well-being. Take the physical body um, and the effects on the physical body. Many people, by the way, sleep with their phones, and 50% of cell phone users use their phone in the middle of the night, check it in the middle of the night. Uh, people, of course, on the streets, in the subway, etc., no longer pay attention to the physical environment and the people around them, but instead are glued uh, to the little screen um, in their hands. Apart from the fact that um, cell phone use may result in less activity, less exercise, and so on, finally, researchers are catching up on sort of studying some of the other effects of uh, cell phone use. It's a little bit scary that this year there will be 2.5 billion people using smartphones, but only now researchers are slowly sort of catching up and studying what the effects are of this technology in our lives. And unfortunately, the news is not very good. Um, I collected a bunch of articles. Um, this is one on the effects on posture and respiration, which are very negative and have uh, health consequences. The effects on sleep. I already mentioned that 50% of people check their device during the night, but many people, of course, for, um, use it right before they go to sleep and use of a device before going to sleep is correlated with poor sleep quality and taking more time uh, to fall asleep. Um, in general, use or hours per day spent on the phone is uh, negatively correlated with sleep duration and sleep quality. And the quality of sleep is inversely correlated basically with health. Sleep, um, uh, negative or bad sleep correlates with um, uh, all sorts of uh, problems such as cardiovascular problems, um, anxiety problems, and more. But uh, these devices also have negative effects on our mental uh, well-being. While they give us all this access to all this wonderful information, I think that they're actually making it harder for us to sort of have all of these types of qualities which are really important and key to be successful in life. To be successful, you don't just need to have all uh, the information at your fingertips. You need to have motivation. You need to have grit. You need to uh, be able to pay attention, have a good memory, um, be able to regulate your emotions, have self-confidence, be able to be creative and more. And again, researchers are showing lately that all of these types of characteristics are negatively impacted by uh, smartphones. Take uh, the effect on memory. Betsy Sparrow from Columbia University did research showing that when people read an article on a phone or on a device, they actually don't really read it and process it and really internalize what the article says. Instead, they just sort of quickly glance at the article to figure out what is in the article so that later they can go back to the article if they actually want to look up some information in that article. So people who read on paper were able to, or they read totally differently than the people who read the same article um, on a device and the people who read it on paper really put the information into their heads and made sense of it, while the people who read it on the device uh, didn't. 
another effect on memory, it turns out that if you have a phone present, you will uh, basically not think about a question, but instead you'll just Google it. Uh, you don't practice and exercise your own mental capabilities because it's much easier to just ask uh, Google what the answer to a particular question is. And the more you do that, the more you start relying on Google and whatever else to answer the questions and the less you sort of challenge your own brain uh, to solve problems and look up information, come up with ideas, be creative, etc. Effects on social interactions. It used to be the case that if we needed help with someone, we would actually call a friend or a family member and ask for advice. Well, these days, people go to their devices. They no longer go to their uh, friends and relatives, which again, then, of course, reduces the well-being and the health of our social relationships and the social fabric that is so important. Um, of course, I don't have to tell you that just having a phone present when you're with uh, another person also, again, diminishes the quality of that interaction, that face-to-face -face interaction that you have with another person. Even when the phone isn't even in use, it already distracts you from the, the other person that you're with and you're less present and paying less attention uh, to the other person. Effects on attention and task performance. Um, studies were done that showed that even the mere presence of a phone upside down on the table where you are doing a, a task, if, that, if there's a phone present there, you do less well at that task. Even if you never check the phone, it's upside down, it doesn't like beep or tell you that you have some messages. Just that phone being there makes you be distracted, makes you think about what may be happening, I guess, uh, online, what you may be missing out on right now, and so on. And it reduces um, how you do on tasks. Last um, effect on mental well-being. In England, a study was done that smartphone use is directly correlated with um, negative uh, uh, well-being, with anxiety and other issues. You may have heard that there's an epidemic, actually, uh, among young people, sort of college age, uh, high school and college age kids, there's a real anxiety epidemic. And um, there's speculation, we, don't, we have correlation but not causation, that smartphone use may be at the basis uh, of this or may be contributing uh, to this epidemic. So, of course, one reason why um, cell phones and smartphones are so bad for us is that they uh, require us to constantly shift attention. We are today living in two worlds. We're living in the physical world, where maybe we're driving down the street or giving a talk in front of an audience. And at the same time, we have our life in the digital world, where all this stuff is going on that we have to keep track of and pay attention to, etc. And the two worlds are totally un related. It's only when you use a navigation app uh, that you actually, that the two are working together and that the system is giving you information that is relevant to your physical presence right now. But with all of the other apps and services that you use, basically they have nothing to do with what you're doing right now um, in the physical world. A second problem, and this is a um, Comes, um, is an analogy that came to me um, from um, a colleague, Albert Schmidt. Um, and a second problem is that the use of today's smartphone is very cumbersome. Um, the guys here in the audience can have their phone uh, clipped to their belt or in their uh, pocket, back pocket, front pocket. But for women, we all have a big bag and when our phone rings or when we get a message, it already takes like 10 seconds before we can find it in our bag, open it up, open the app, et cetera, and see what's going on. Um, so today's smartphone can really be compared, if we, we look, make this analogy with vision technologies, with a monocle. Um, a monocle, you also have to go find it in the different pockets that you have and then put it in, your, in front of your eye um, to maybe see something a little bit better. That's what today's smartphone use is like. Of course, a lot of 
either have glasses on your heads or wear contact lenses that you can have, um, uh, that you can use for say 30 days at a time without ever removing them. They're completely personalized to your particular vision problem and you forget that they are there. They just allow you to see the world differently, better. Um, so what we are interested in in my group and what I think the world needs is the equivalent of the contact lenses, but for um, sort of the more cognitive tasks uh, that we engage in. And I call this technology of, uh, or this category of systems wearable cognitive enhancement. I agree it's not a very sexy term. If anyone has a better idea, <laughs> please come and talk to me later. But I think that basically we will move towards something that is always on, that is always with us, and that changes our perception of reality the way contact lenses do, and that helps us with all sorts of goals that we have, with um, par particular um, sort of challenges that we have, and so on. Something that really enhances our cognition the way contact lenses are, um, enhance our vision. So in my group, for the last uh, 20 years, really, we've been working on this type of system that is always on. You don't turn it off and on. It's always on and always paying attention to the user and the context of the user and really mediating the user's perception and experience of reality, not just using vision, but also other modalities, um, auditory, augmentation and changes of what you perceive, um, uh, smell or scent-based augmentation, haptic augmentation, and so on. And one way in which what we're doing also with um, uh, these systems is different from today's cell phones is that the devices we built often use sort of a, a more subconscious uh, stimuli or to basically affect the user's behavior and thinking so that you don't always distract the user uh, by, ha by giving them a message that they have to p pay attention to and so on. The system we, systems we built are also personalized. They learn about the user and they are personalized to the user, uh, complementing what the user's own strengths and weaknesses and limitations are. Now, I think that the time is right to rethink smartphones and to sort of throw them in the garbage bin and uh, come up or, or adopt this new type of uh, technology that I think is superior. And I believe that, is, uh, um, that the time is right because different uh, things have come together, different emerging technologies are basically at the point where we can start building these systems. One enabler is augmentation technologies, what this conference is about. Not just the um, uh, visual augmentation, we also work a lot with audio augmentation. One interesting uh, product, for example, that you may want to look at is the Bose earphones, which is a set of headphones that can change in real time what you hear. It takes with multiple um, microphones your audio and reprocesses your audio in real time so that you can focus on the person that you are talking to at a busy party and all the noise around you or all the conversations around you are lowered in volume, but that particular person's voice is enhanced and, and louder. Um, so it's, I think there's very interesting opportunities um, for such audio-based augmented reality uh, systems as well that really change your audio perception of the world around you. Uh, we have also been working with other modalities like scent. Scent is underappreciated, is a very powerful um, modality that can affect memory, that can affect mood um, and so on. And uh, we work with scent-based systems, I'll show you in a minute, in sort of helping a person deal uh, with their daily life. A second enabler um, is the sensor technologies that are now available and, um, in small, cheap form factors. 
as well as the algorithms to interpret uh, all this uh, sensor data. Uh, sensors uh, like cameras, of course, like the Google Clips um, uh, coming out that um, can sort of pay attention to the world around you and even then with algorithms analyze whether there's people present or what objects are present, etc. cetera. Um, but also technologies uh, that pay attention to the user, the state of the user themselves, uh, like in-ear EEG sensing that can tell how your eyes are moving, what your brain uh, waves are like. Uh, sensors like the Empatica developed uh, here also at the Media Lab that give you um, uh, heart rate, heart rate variability, skin conductance, etc., and can give you insight or can give the system insight into the emotional state of the user, whether the user is stressed, anxious, calm, etc. So I believe that these cognitive enhancement systems will have access to what is out there in front of the user, what the user is doing, as well as what is happening inside uh, of the user's body and mind. And third, the third enabler is, of course, artificial intelligence technology and specifically machine learning technology that can be used to model users. Today's cell phones don't really learn about you. They don't really, they're not really personalized. I think technologies um, in the future will be much more personalized and we learn to predict your behavior. They will learn what your habits and preferences are, etc. cetera, and they, they can become more efficient and effective because they know you, they know how you like things, they know what you're good at and what you're bad at, they can predict what you are about to do, etc. So I'll give you some examples uh, from our own work um, uh, of cognitive enhancement systems that change how people make decisions, how people learn, how people will deal with memory, uh, memory issues as well as trying to learn uh, things or put things in their own memory and how people regulate their emotions. Um, we already mentioned Valentin Hoen, who's now at PTC, a PhD student, former PhD student in the group, who has been building systems that can give you real-time information, for example, to uh, sort of help you with your decision making if you don't eat wheat and you don't eat um, corn syrup, the system can just overlay this information on your uh, visual field that tells you whether uh, which of the cereals that you're looking at um, basically are a safe bet uh, for you or not. Um, so decision making will be one of the things, of course, that will be augmented uh, in a big way. But I want to give you some other examples as well. Um, some of my current students are working on the use of augmented reality for learning. Today, most kids, of course, still learn in the classroom, sitting down, listening to a, a teacher. But I think increasingly, we will learn in the real world. We will see the physics concepts that are associated with the ball that we are tossing around. Uh, we'll see the velocity, uh, the speed, the path of the ball, et cetera, and be able, we'll be able to learn um, while we're um, engaged in a playful activity. Uh, Mina Khan in my group has been uh, working on this project Mathland. Um, it seems, um, and it uses uh, the HoloLens and is a system for multiple users to basically learn about physics by having both uh, physical objects as well as virtual objects um, that uh, interact with one another. And you can basically see um, what uh, the concepts are or what the physics um, concepts are of uh, the things that you're working with. You can solve puzzles together, etc. cetera. Um, and um, the system, by the way, is inspired by Seymour Papert, one of the founders of the Media Lab, who said, well, in France, or if you live in France, you basically learn French without thinking about it. We should build a math land, a, a version of reality where you just naturally learn about math and physics because it's always there and it's sort of, uh, you don't have to like 
go learn it from a book or from a teacher or whatever. It's just always present and you learn about it. Um, similarly, another student in the group, Christian Vasquez, is working on language learning. Um, again, um, when you learn a second language, you do it naturally. You don't have to learn from books or something. So he's using the HoloLens um, and computer vision technology to recognize objects in your surroundings and label them and give you example sentences of that object um, in uh, uh, the target language, in this case, English. He's even gone further than that recently. He recognizes some of the gestures that you can perform, for example, on a cup, like drink, pour, etc. And the system will give you the word in the language that you're trying to learn as you are performing those gestures. And Christian's um, user uh, tests and studies show that people um, have an easier time basically learning words in another language when they really engage in that activity and when they hear the word while they're engaging in the activity. Um, <clears throat> We've been working on memory augmentation. This is a very interesting system that uses augmented reality to help you learn a set of facts. Uh, we have two types of memory, factual and episodic memory. And it's very hard to learn facts while it's very easy to sort of remember episodes. For example, if you came from the subway station to the media lab, it's easy. You can just do that once and you sort of remember the path uh, from the subway station to the media lab. But remembering, say, the Super Bowl winners of the last 20 years is a lot harder because there's no consistency. It's not related to your physical presence and so on. So what we did is we, we tied the two together. We an allow a person with an augmented reality headset to follow a familiar path that they know, in this case, going from the subway to the media lab office that they work in. And while they do so, they see the subsequent winners of the Super Bowl visualized in their fi visual fields. Um, so they see the Cowboys and the Jets and the Packers and so on as they go from the T, the subway, um, to the media lab. And it turns out that by doing so, you only need to show people or experience this once, and you remember that sequence of Super Bowl winners um, for a very long time. In fact, I did it myself now a year and a half ago, and I can still tell you, even though I have zero interest <laughs> in the Super Bowl, who the winners are, because all I have to do is mentally revisit this path coming up from the train station, and I see Packers, Packers, Jets, Cowboys, etc., cetera, uh, Colts, I may get some of the names wrong because I, I remember the picture, but I don't remember their actual name. Um, but basically, doing that just once, um, people, we, we compare this with a paper-based task where people learn this set of Super Bowl winners on paper. And while right after the studying, the two groups perform the same, uh, 24 hours later, the people that learned the sequence on paper have already forgotten more than half of what they learned. And 24 hours, uh, seven days later, it's even more, while the people who learned it in this augmented reality type of way, in this more situated uh, way, um, are able to remember that set of facts. We've been doing other work on uh, memory augmentation. We're actually very focused right now on um, Alzheimer's and dementia and how we can help people with Alzheimer's and dementia um, sort of still make more sense uh, of uh, their life and their experience and live more independently. For example, by giving them subtle audio um, information about the people that they are about to meet and where they are, etc. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're not just limiting ourselves to video and audio. We're very interested in other modalities as well. Judith Amores has been working on scent as an interface, and it's fascinating, the science of scent and what it 
uh, does to our minds and can, um, what effect it can have on our mood and memory and learning. So she built this device that uses the um, Empatica wristband to get information about the affective state of the user as well as the EEG Muse headset. And uh, the system can actually release certain scents based on your uh, aff affect and based on your mental state. Um, so, for example, if you're nervous or anxious, um, it can release a scent that will calm you down. If you instead you're behind the wheel late at night and you need to be woken up um, or you need to be more alert, it can um, give you um, a scent that, like peppermint that uh, wakes you up, etc. There's huge potential for learning, actually. It turns out that if you learn things while being presented with these additional um, scent cues, you can remember and recall things better. Um, so we think that um, these types of ambient interfaces that don't really require or need your attention, they're just there and you may barely be aware that there's peppermint or vanilla or whatever, they can nevertheless help you greatly with your life, with remembering, with regulating your mood, etc. Similarly, this uh, project by Shin Liu, she will talk tomorrow as well, um, actually records your breathing and plays it back to you slower or faster, you can vary it, and it turns out that the way we sort of uh, see ourselves as being anxious is by, uh, uh, to a large extent, interpreting the signals from our body. Um, so you interpret your heart rate and how fast you're breathing. And if you breathe hard, your heart rate is going fast. Then you, this, your brain decides that you're basically anxious or nervous. Her system gives you false feedback. And it turns out that people are less anxious if you give them this slowed down feedback of their own breathing sound. She actually had students uh, do a test, a GRE test. Um, and uh, some of them had a faster breathing sound and others had their own breathing played back with bone conduction in a slower way. And the ones that uh, were listening to their own breathing slowed down actually had significantly less anxiety uh, than the other ones. So huge potential to help people uh, with um, uh, sort of emotion regulation. Um, going further, some of our work is even now ab about creating interfaces that help you at night. Um, Dormio is a system that uses EEG and other sensors, uh, EDA, etc., to measure your sleep state. And it can uh, basically do different things, not just monitor what state you're in, but it can also help you be more creative by talking to you at the uh, the uh, sort of the stage in your sleep uh, uh, called hypnagogia, where uh, you are sort of drowsy and not totally awake, but you're not quite asleep yet. At that moment, the system reminds you to think about something that you want to dream about or think about, like if you have you want to be creative about a particular project, come up with a solution to a particular problem the robot um, actually talks to you and um, records what you are talking about when you're in this very uh, drowsy state. It's actually a technique that was used by famous um, scientists and uh, artists throughout the years, Edgar Allan Poe, um, um, Dali, many others used this technique to be creative and we made it uh, easier for people uh, to sort of tap into that part of their consciousness. So in summary, I think we need to, be, to move beyond uh, today's smartphones towards cognitive enhancement systems, systems that are aware of the user's context as well as the current state of the user that can affect the user's thinking and behavior using multiple modalities, uh, some of them uh, requiring more consciousness than others. Systems that are highly personalized to the user and the user's goals and challenges and things they want to work on, 
and that really proactively assist uh, the user constantly by changing their perception of reality and augmenting their perception of reality. Of course, we should be mindful of potential dangers and problems, and um, I, every new student who joins my group has to watch all of the Black Mirror episodes <laughs> uh, just to sort of make them a little bit more aware of how some of these technologies could go uh, the wrong way and to design sort of with uh, those potential problems in mind, uh, invasion of privacy, lack of understanding, control, dependency, creating bubble worlds where suddenly you don't see the poor uh, people on the street sleeping on the streets anymore because your augmented reality system has removed them uh, from your view, etc. But in, I am overall very optimistic that augmented reality can rescue our relationship uh, with our smartphones. And I believe that um, augmented reality and these cognitive enhancement systems will really constitute the fourth era of computing. We've had mainframes, we've had desktops, we've had um, mobile devices. The next thing will be devices that are highly personalized on us all the time and uh, that are much less disruptive because they are always on, because um, they avoid uh, these constant attention shifts, uh, because they use multiple modalities so they don't always sort of have as much of a uh, re requirement or demand in terms of conscious and uh, processing and cognitive load. And lastly, they will know us in a very um, pers uh, personal and intimate way, meaning that they can be much more efficient in terms of their interaction with us uh, because they know us so well and uh, have good models of us. Thank you. Thank you.